Report. chat. Oh, it's game over. It's coming up. There it is. Oh, say open now, chat. Say open now. Here it is. Oh, here I am. Yay. Welcome to the stream, everybody. Oh, and there it is. Now it's at And welcome to the stream, everyone. Hope everyone's having a very nice Tuesday evening. Guys, I am back continuing my adventures in Metal Gear Rising Revengeance, which we shall play soon, chat, soon, but I have an obligation I must fulfill. Another obligation to all of you. Which is another movie review uh, for uh, this classic, which you just saw a still from, Gremlins 2, colon, the new batch. Mm. But okay, guys, let's get into it. Now, as you all know, I'm a huge fan of the original Gremlins, uh, the, 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 the 1984 classic film directed by Joe Dante. I just like it. I just like that movie so much because I mean, it kind of presents itself initially. It's like, oh, it's like a family comedy, but then it has this really kind of fucked up horror element where they're not afraid to just murder people <laughs> in the worst ways possible. And it's like that's how I kind of liked it because Gremlins came out in that time, same year that uh, I believe Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom came out, where that invented, that contributed to, uh, to the invention of the PG thirteen rating because they're like, okay, this is a little. It's not quite an R, but this is, this can fuck some kids up if they see it too young at PG. And that's where, you know, the origin of the PG-13 rating. Well, apparently, the parents groups and the studios are like, you know, yeah, Gremlins was a huge success. On like, a, what, $11 million budget, ended up grossing, what, nearly $150 million. Huge fucking profit. And they're like, studios like, well, that was such a success. Let's just do it again, except let's tone it down. Let's not make it be so aggressive or mean. You're not really focusing on the horror elements. You know what? Let's focus on the stuff that all those parents groups and those critics wanted. They wanted, let's make it a little more family friendly. And that's what they did for Gremlins too, guys. It's Gremlins without its fucking teeth. They're just gums. That's all it is. I'm going to say it right now. Gremlins 2 has no goddamn teeth. It, it, it forgot what it, where it came from. What made the original so goddamn good, and it's a, it is a soft successor, a uh, a, a, a faded version of the original film. People are going to be like, "Oh, Chris, how could you say that?" Because I've seen it now. <laughs> I saw it once back in the day, and I've seen it now. Chat. Now we're going to get right into it. I even don't like the way the, I, I don't even like the way this movie starts. Um, you know, we're not we're not jumping like right into it like back in the mythology introduced to the characters no we're introduced to the film with a little sh uh, odd short to me which again established you know what gremlins 2 is guys gremlins 2 is a cartoon that's what it is it wholeheartedly embraces that and i think that's a huge mistake and i think that's what contributes to its kind of just blah tone in general the one that just kind of makes it uninteresting for the most part at least for me where it doesn't open up with like you know uh, how the, the original film does, you know, like, uh, it's like, oh, this is kind of weird, it, it, it's funny, it's dark at the same time. No, it opens up with a, a literal cartoon of Bugs Bunny and Daffy Duck uh, just talking shit to each other. And where Bugs Bunny's, you got the Warner Brothers logo, da, 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 all that bullshit, all that, uh, you know, the, the dancing and the song and everything. Bugs Bunny's out there on the goddamn Warner Brothers shield, 
He's like, you know, what's up, Doc? And Devin Duck's not fucking having any of it. He's like, fuck this. I don't want... You've had your glory for 50 goddamn years. I'm going to be on the logo now. And, De and you know, Bugs is like, uh, okay, I sure, why not? You go on the logo. And Davy Duck gets in the logo. Again, Chad, this is fucking Gremlins too. Why are we not in the movie yet? We're just we're just watching Bugs Bunny and Daffy Duck right now argue, which we've seen for at this point in the film, or at least this point in, in, in this uh, in time period, 1990, when this film came out, for 50 goddamn years. It's old. We fucking get it. Get to the film. But no, we got to have this whole thing between Bugs and Daffy. And Daffy gets on the logo, and the, the, the logo fucks with him, and, you know, he ends up getting caught inside the logo, and he, you know, he's kind of a little deformed and shit. And then the movie starts. Oh, what a wonderful number. That was so funny. <laughs> it is not way better. <laughs> oh, bullshit, Chris Ayers. Now, Rise of Skywalker is infinitely better than Gremlins 2. I'm going to tell you that right now. And so we cut then to New York, guys. It's like, oh, wow, so we've moved away. We moved away from the small town in which Billy and his family lived, where he first encountered Gizmo when his dad brought home on his adventures. Well, now we learn that uh, Billy's dad got Gizmo in New York because... After the, you know, this wide shot taken in New York, 1990s era New York, we go to the shop of Wing, who is the owner of, uh, of Gizmo, among a number of uh, ancient Chinese uh, magical artifacts. And he's just in there smoking. And it's like, and he's, and here's the thing, Chad, he's just smoking, he's puffing away, and he goes, you hear a, <laughs> <laughs> oh, Wing's not sounding too good. It's like, maybe you should stop smoking. But then we also hear the, the little Gizmo song, which is, it's so adorable. You know, and he's like, oh, we don't see Gizmo, but we know he's there, and it's great. But then we cut out of the, uh, the, the shop where clearly Wing is, you know, on death's door, very close to it. And then we're following uh, this uh, limo, driving right through the middle of Chinatown, just fucking honking at people, just to get the fuck out of the way. The people clearly have the right of way. You know, like, it's a red light, but this guy doesn't give a shit. He's like, we got to get to Wing's Oriental Shop. And they call it Oriental Shop, Chad. I'm not being racist. They call it the Oriental Shop of Magical Gifts or whatever. And so they're driving through, because we see him in the, in the in, in, you know, in the above. And we see him driving up to the shop, honking at people, nearly running little Chinese kids over. It's terrible. But they finally get there. They, you know, they pull over. This big executive guy, he walks out, which we will we'll soon learn he's actually head of security at the Clamp Institute, or the Clamp, I don't know, Corporation? The Clamp Corporation, that's what it is. And so, or Clamp Center. And I think the guy's name, what's this, what's this son of a bitch name? Oh, I don't remember, chat. We're going to call him Business Guy Number One. But he gets out of the car, and he's got to go talk to Mr. Wing, because apparently Mr. Wing has refused to sell his shop to the Clamp Corporation, because Clamp Corporation just wants to knock that shit down and build a new Chinatown. You know, one for the modern ages. Not all this ancient shit. They're done with it. So business guy number one, he walks in there and he's like, hey, Mr. Wing, how you doing, Mr. Wing? <laughs> he can't talk. He can barely, he's, he's on death's door at this point. But he says, I'm fine. What the hell do you want? And business guy goes, listen, I know that you've refused to sell your business here. And it's, it's wonderful. It's quaint. It's, you know, all these gifts from the Orient. And the God, I love it. <laughs> because as soon as he says that, Mr. Wing goes, you racist motherfucker. <laughs> I don't, you know I don't call it the goddamn Orient, but whatever. He's like, listen, I, I know you, you love having this place, but we have another offer for you. Let's actually, you know, let's tell you what we're actually going to do. And the guy, business guy number one, he doesn't even say, like, what, like, you know, giving him, like, I'm giving the rundown, the spiel. He brings in a goddamn television, and basically the skinnier more handsome version of Donald Trump is on it because I think this is also a very subtle critique of, of Donald Trump in a way. Or maybe it's because it's Trump, you know, he's president right now and you just, you just hear the name and see the face and you just associate big business with the presidency right now. That's what I saw in, in, in Mr. Clamp is Trump, but we're going to call him Mr. Clamp. Brings in the Mr. Clamp television and Mr. Clamp on a, VH, a VHS tape chat basically gets the rundown to Mr. Wings like, listen, this is very charming. I respect you as a, as a fellow business owner, but this is what I want to do. I want to build a modern Chinatown, and your little rinky-dink fucking shop is in the goddamn way. Get going. Move on. Listen, man, I'm going to give you a lot of money. Don't worry about it. Mr. Wing says, after well, he doesn't really say it to the television because the television is you know, can't respond to it. But after the video ends, Mr. Wing says, you know what? I'm just, I'm just not interested. No, thank you. Please, uh, you know. 
peruse the shop, if you will, but once you once you're done perusing, please please leave. And the guy's like, all right, we'll go. We'll fucking go. And so, you know, they walk outside. And uh, the driver is like, oh, I'm sorry, business guy number one. Because I don't remember any of these people's names yet. <laughs> I can't remember. What is this guy's name? Help me out here. Oh. Uh, he's in like the cast list or something. No. Oh, For Forrester. His name is Forrester. That's it. His name is, he's the security chief. And I guess he's also the delivery television man for Mr. Clamp. But Forrester, he walks out and he's with his driver. And the driver says, oh. Who was that right there? Uh, Prince Locke! Thank you for the follow. You're welcome here. Welcome to the stream. Just talking about Gremlins 2 at the moment. And so Mr. Forrester, he, he goes out of the shop and he's with his drive. And the driver says, oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Forrester. That didn't work out. He's like, don't worry, buddy. You hear that cough in there? That old man's going to die. So it doesn't matter. We're going to take a shop anyway. We'll just wait until he's dead. Which is pretty fucking dark and furious. I'm like, oh, that's kind of cool. All right. This is, what, this is the darkness I wanted to enter in the film chat. It's like, it's dealing with life and death situations. Big business. Pressing down the little people. It's like, okay, I see what you're doing, uh, movie. Very, very subtle. I, I, this is cool. And then we cut back to the shop. Oh, by the way, they left the TV there for Mr. Wing because he didn't have a television. And Gizmo, and then we see Gizmo chat, and we all know Gizmo loves TV. And so he takes the little remote, and he starts watching the TV, and what does he land on, chat? Rambo 2, or no, it's, it's Rambo First Blood Part 2. And he's enjoying the shit out of it. And this is where, this is where we start to learn Gizmo has been a little bored in his life. <laughs> you know he's, he's basically living in a goddamn cage in this uh, Chinese shop for like what the past at least six years because the original movie takes place in 1984 and now we find ourselves in 1990 so he's yeah he needs some you know something to focus on and like the first thing he sees on television in, the, in six years the box that he loves so much is is goddamn Sylvester Stallone just murdering a whole bunch of Vietnamese people so probably not the best program for Gizmo to watch but he's loving it and the, and the, you know, Mr. Wayne's like, oh, Jesus, no, television, this, this is a thing for fools. Gizmo, I don't want you to watch it because you'll clearly be inspired by it and cause violence. Gizmo's like, no, I, no, I, I know it's not real. I won't be inspired by this. So Mr. Wayne turns it off and he starts coughing again, gagging on whatever the hell he's been smoking. And then we cut to six weeks later, chap. Uh, and we find out that, oh, uh, Mr. Clamp has bought Mr. Wing's shop because Mr. Wing is fucking dead. <laughs> he dies off screen. This incredibly important character from the original movie, you know, who originally, you know, was gonna sell Gizmo, uh, to Billy's dad, but didn't end up doing it because he knew that, you know what, Billy's dad, he's not responsible. He knew that this kid, this fucking kid, Billy, I've never seen him. I don't know him, but I know he's not responsible to have him. And then Mr. Wing's goddamn grandson, apparently. You know what happened, chat? This is what fucking happened. It's the same thing that happened in the movie. We just didn't see it. You know, in the original film, Mr. Wing's grandson basically sells Gizmo uh, to Billy's dad. And since Mr. Wing didn't, Mr. Wing didn't really want to do it, this is what happened. When Mr. Wing de uh, died, off screen, by the way, Mr. Wing's grandson was like, I don't give a shit about this place. Just give me the money, baby. And he's the one that pocketed this. He took that dirty clamp money, chat. And he sold the shop to Mr. Clamp and his associates. And so that kid is a piece of shit. So next time when I see this movie, Chad, I'm gonna know. I was like, nah, you gotta kill that kid. I wish the gremlins got that little son of a bitch. He, he deserved it, Chad. You know, I don't like violence against kids, but fuck that kid. And so uh, Mr. Clamp and his construction crew, they're, you know, they're turning off the whole block. They're about to knock down the shop. But Gizmo is still inside there. You know, I didn't know why anyone didn't just go in the shop and find this creature who's still alive. There might be other mogwai in there other you know ancient chinese creatures we don't know at this point and so it's very irresponsible of mr clamp and associates clearly they were not up to code they don't care they are not taking responsibilities for the buildings that they're purchasing there could have been no hope that mr wing's family could have been in there too you, you just don't know so gizmo's like shit i gotta get out of here because this place is fucking coming down and so you know the goddamn uh uh you know uh what was not the claw what's the big thing with the 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 thing with that miley cyrus wrecking ball the wrecking ball chat so the the, the wrecking ball comes in and takes out half the building gizmo goes ah and gizmo he gets out of his little cage and he starts hustling out and it's so adorable and cute you know little little gizmo, you know but it's not good chat because outside it's 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 uh it's day and as we all know uh gremlins or excuse me mogwai they're very sensitive to light and if they're exposed to light for too long they could die so gizmo is like i either die inside here 
get buried underneath the rubble of my home for the past six years and or prison for the past six years or i take my chances and run out and try to find some shade well thankfully despite the construction crew just ravaging mr wing's shop the gizmo gets out there he manages to find some cover some shade he's hiding under a trash can and then all of a sudden this weird obese man comes out it's like hello little thing and just picks him up <laughs> and again this guy creepy as hell i don't remember what he specifically says but he's all about gizmo he just grabs him it's like who is this man he should not have gizmo he's probably gonna fuck it yet i imagine that's what was gonna happen it all led up to that but then we immediately cut to i guess several days later or something like that and here now we're introduced to billy and kate from the original film and lo and behold chat they, they too are living in new york city they're trying to make it they got out of their little shitville town after it was nearly destroyed by the gremlins actually most of it was destroyed by the gremlins and since their town's economy clearly did collapse many people were murdered although a few weren't apparently uh they're like you know what we have to leave this town this thing's falling apart let's go to the big apple and make our lives let's let's earn some big bucks but little did they know chat this is pre giuliani new york and it's a fucking nightmare <laughs> where everyone's rude everyone's just stealing from each other in broad day everyone's knocking each other down just ah, ah. i mean i'm not exaggerating it's like that kind of shit it's like listen i'm i'm from new york state i've been in new york many times now i was not there during pre giuliani new york so i don't know but it's a little exaggerated and you know they're trying to show like oh the you only know, these, these people from the small town and you know the midwest coming to the big city look how intimidating it is it's like okay it's it, they're, they're laying on a little too thick again most of this movie laying on a little too thick in my opinion and so they're walking and like the first dialogue is not like getting you know caught up in the relationship or who they are as people no it's fucking retconning chat and this is part of the movie that i do not like this retconning bullshit we learn that uh the character played by dick miller who is uh fe featured in a lot of of um joe dante's films uh small soldiers uh played a very similar character matter of fact uh, uh murray futterman and his wife sure uh, sheila futterman survived the events of the original gremlins even though they clearly died they were clearly crushed by a gremlin driving Mr. Futterman's uh, uh, plow, uh, uh, plow truck, like run over and just torn apart by it. But no, no, they're, they're totally fine. We just learned that, you know, they were they were just covering from their injuries about being run over from a fucking plow truck <laughs> and, and apparently went to therapy, you know, for emotional and psychological distress. And they've been recovering for these six years, Chad. And apparently, you know, they want to get out of that town too because the economy is just so depressed. And they're visiting Billy and Kate, by the way, uh billy's fiance is kate and it's like oh that's adorable they're finally getting together i love it except we don't really learn about the relationship at all they just kind of talk about the futtermans which apparently are incredibly popular characters i didn't know that i think honestly guys joe dante just really likes dick miller and that's why he brought him back i think clearly they're friends in real life and you know he's always featured in a lot of joe dante's movies but still to me i didn't like this this is kind of bullshit the futtermans clearly died in that first film do you disagree with me are we okay is that okay? He has a person who has a dick named Dick Conspiracy Confirmation? Yes! Absolutely. <laughs> Dude, as long as they don't bring back Joe Pesci, I'll be like, oh, now you're talking about Lethal Weapon. I'm not in the Lethal Weapon movies. I'm talking about Gremlins not right now, chat. Hey, Nate, welcome to the stream. Good to see you. She like this why I call it the, oh, I call it the Rise of Skywalker of its time. Takes all the teeth away. Oh, you. You and your Rise of Skywalker. Hey, like, I had Christmas in the movie too, man, but nah. No, Gremlins 2 is a little bit worse in my opinion. But so we get some exposition. And also, chat, uh, we find out where Billy and uh Kate work. They work at the 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 clamp megalopolis. You know, this giant uh the I think the biggest building in the city, the most automated, most advanced uh, skyscraper in the middle of New York. That's where they work. Billy's an artist, uh an, I guess an architect maybe it's not he's kind of nebulous they like he's clearly an artist you know doing like rough drafts of like buildings for projects but we don't really see any specific like designs and how things are like situated you know like math and shit but he just draws a lot he's a you know he's in pr maybe maybe that's what it is pr and he's an architect and his fiance is a tour guide for the building 
And so they go in there. Uh, you know, Kate says, all right, well, I'll see you later. Let's get dinner. And Billy's like, oh, okay. And, you know, Billy, he goes back up to his office. And then, then he encounters, again, one of the most stereotypically, <laughs> like, versions of a New Yorker I've ever seen. I forget what's his, what's his, um, what's his boss's name? She's ridiculous. Oh, my God. I can't remember her name, Chad. See, I get the New York lady, Red. We're just going to call her Red. Because she has this bright red hair, and she sounds like this. She sounds like a live-action Harley Quinn, except even more exaggerated than Margot Robbie's character. It's like, they live in the middle of New York, and she's the only one that has the thickest New York accent in the world. And again, she comes off super cartoony, as most of the other characters do throughout this entire film. You know, and she's kind of weirdly antagonistic but also flirtatious with billy you know as he's doing his drawings you know she's critiquing him stuff and you know she's showing off the goods you know the the bazongas the bajingas chat and you know she's leaning over and everything so clearly she's got a thing for billy but she's his boss so you know she wants to also dominate him chat a dominatrix you know in the bdsm and all that and all that good stuff and so she's critiquing him and then El in walks in mr forrester this prick who is saying all those terrible things about mr wing didn't give a shit that he died clearly sold uh, you know, clearly his, the, the business was sold to him via uh, Mr. Wing's grandchild, that little lazy son of a bitch chap. No hard work ethic in that kid. And hope he's dead. Hope the gremlins got him in the end. Um, he's like, okay, Billy, listen, I don't like your workspace. You know, you got a plant here, which is like a small little potted plant. And I don't like this cute little drawing you did of your top. But like, really just being a prick. Like, clearly, like, what's wrong with having a little plant? What's wrong with just, you know, drawing your, you know, your small town? This guy, again, he's the kind of guy that is incredibly narcissistic and lonely in his life. And the only enjoyment he gets is torturing and making other people's lives miserable. He's a prick. We don't like him. Again, a super cartoony villain who clearly wouldn't exist in real life. And it's just like, all right, whatever. Clearly, something bad's going to happen to you. And it does. Later on in the film. And so Billy's like, he's really intimidated. He's downtrodden. You know, he's got a ship, he's got a, uh, uh, his boss is weirdly affectionate, but also domineering. He's, his boss of bosses is even more of a prick. He's like, ah, I can't deal with this. I'm going to go off and visit my friend, uh, Dracula. I forget, he, the guy has a name, we're just going to call him Dracula. Uh, Fred, Fred Dracula, that's what he is. But, chat, we then cut from all that nonsense, and then we pick up where what happened to Gizmo. Where has Gizmo gone? Where did that pedophile-esque man take him apparently it's in the same building that billy works because the clamp corporation not only does it have like you know uh, it's an it's you know uh, about building uh uh, uh buildings and everything like that real estate chat you know movies uh, multiple television channels they're also into genetics i guess they're into splicing and this is another part of the movie i don't particularly care for the splicing element but we are introduced to like a hallmark of you know I, you know corny um horror films certainly of like the 50s 60s and 70s and 80s christopher lee guys christopher lee you know dr scaramanga or not dr scaramanga mr scaramanga francisco scaramanga from the man of the golden gun goddamn dracula in multiple hammer horror films count dooku yeah Again, not one of his better roles, but, you know, it's, you know, it's all right. A Sauron from Lord of the Rings. Guy's had an amazing career. What, has been acting for, what, nearly 70 years? You know, until he passed away, sadly, a couple of years ago? An incredible breadth of work, which also, sadly, included Gremlins 2, colon, New Batch. So we're introduced to Christopher Lee, and uh, he's going to the office because he's all about, you know, I need more germs. I need animals. I want to create, I want to splice everything together because splicing makes things fun. He's all about it. You know, he's collecting the goddamn used tissue paper of his secretary. And, oh, he, oh, this, this, this part, chat. This one I was actually really surprised by <laughs> in the film. We have a surprise appearance from Tuco from Breaking Bad <laughs> and Better Call Saul who plays a delivery boy. And he's delivering all these packages to different people. Uh, matter of fact, he actually delivered... Uh, well, and you know what? I, I reversed the scenes. We catch up with Billy later. And this, like, the gizmo scene at this point takes place before all the stuff that happened with Billy and his boss and his other boss. But he's delivering a package of germs to Christopher Lee. You know, that, that blue crystal meth. I don't know. It's something, it's something nefarious. Christopher Lee's very happy. He's all giddy about it. And, you know, they make it terrible puns like, Oh, I wish we had the flu this time of year. Like, oh, it's like, because, you know... He's actually buying diseases and germs to use and, 
And that's when Tuco, he hears the, the, the whistle that Gizmo always does. He's like, oh, that's a good tune. I'm going to use that. I'm going to use that later on in the movie. And then we see what's happening to Gizmo at this point, guys, because the two, by the way, it wasn't just one pedophile that picked up Gizmo. There's two. They're brothers. And maybe they're clones. Because Christopher Lee walks up and is like, hey, guys, how's that clone experiment going? And then we see both of them reveal themselves. So I don't know if one is a clone or they're just twins. Again, it's a really bad psych gag. A lot of those types of jokes throughout the film. It's not very funny, but, you know, fair enough, whatever. Um, and like, oh, it's going swimmingly, Mr. Christopher Lee. Uh, oh, matter of fact, we actually have a new thing that we're experimenting on. That's when they reveal Gizmo. And Christopher Lee is like, what the fuck is that thing? It's adorable. I love it. Let's experiment on it. Let's dissect it. And they're like, no, no, no. And well, let's show off how cute he is. And then we just see for the next five minutes how cute Gizmo is, guys. They play some music for him to dance to. And he walks out and he starts dancing like for a couple seconds and that's like that's a scene but then he tries to scamper off because he's like oh no you don't little son of a bitch you're not going anywhere we're gonna splice you and he puts him back in his cage and he reveals all of his nonsense that he has all those different formulas he's like oh, we're gonna do a lot of good stuff with you then we cut the bill and that's when we see his boss and everything and um uh uh you know the his boss hitting on him and then his boss of bosses being just being a dick he then is later uh, uh, oh, that's when he encounters Tuco, who's, you know, uh, humming or whistling the, you know, the, the gizmo song. He's like, where'd you hear that? Where'd you hear that? And he's like, I don't know, it's in the, the genetic splicing division or whatever. You should go up there. He's like, fuck, I will. I definitely had gizmos clearly in the building that I work in. How fucking convenient. And then at one point he goes to see Dracula, uh, Fred, who, uh, basically runs one of the channels. He's got the, the coveted Saturday, 3.30 a.m. slot chat. Pretty good to show old horror movies. And Dracula Fred, he's just, he's just not, not, you know, he's not happy about it. He wanted a career in broadcasting. That's what he wanted to do with his life. But he's been doing shit jobs or his entire life. It's just, it's terrible. He doesn't like dressing up as Dracula or anything like that. Doesn't even like horror movies, matter of fact. And he, you know, they show off the building, all the advanced features of it. All the, again, consumerism chat. Yeah, the evils of capitalism. It's like, okay, I get it, movie. I get what you're doing. I understand. How it oppresses people. I know. How we're just obsessive buying new things. And that in turn oppresses us. Thank you, movie, for the commentary. I get it. Thank you. Um, and so then after that, Billy, he goes up the genetics uh, wing to try to save Gizmo. Because he's like, where is this little guy? And he actually finds him very quickly, Chase. He's like, oh, there you are. And Gizmo and Billy have like kind of a sort of moment. They don't have time. Because Christopher Lee and the pedophile twins, they're talking about splicing, I guess, or whatever. Uh, different animals, something, I, I don't know, every joke, anytime Christopher Lee or those two pedophiles are on screen, it's a visual gag of some kind, or it's a reference to splicing, that's, that's what, anytime I talk about them, that's what's gonna happen, and so Billy, he gets Gizmo out of there, but he causes distraction, he releases the monkeys, and the monkeys start ca causing a havoc in the lab, and you know, Christopher's like, stop them, how did they get out, and then you get a reference to Alvin the chipmunks, apparently, because one of the pedophile twins says, uh, Alvin, how did you get out of there? And the other pedophile twin says, Theodore, don't you do that. It's like, okay, Jesus. All right. I get it. You want to reference all the properties you own, Warner Brothers. That's, that's adorable. Thank you. Uh, so then we cut to Billy and Gizmo in the bathroom chat. And this is when we get the proper reunion. This is when he takes, he gets, he has, I guess he has like a lunchbox box type thing. He opens it up and Gizmo just looking at him with those, you know, those cute little eyes and Billy's just looking down affectionately. This is the, this is the first moment in the movie where it actually felt real. And it's like, we're at least 25 minutes into it. It's like, okay, this is the real thing where you, I forget the actor who plays Billy. What's his name? Zach Galligan. Good for you, Zach Galligan. He looked down at this creature and you just saw the love and emotion in his face. And whoever was operating that little puppet, you saw in Gizmo's face. And it was a great little reunion between the both of them. And you could just, because he picks him up and he holds him like a baby. And it's like those six years, you know, it was a long time. But now they're here together. They can make up for it now. Because fucking Mr. Wing is dead. And Billy doesn't need to worry about that anymore. <laughs> I can feed you whatever I want. But you know, Billy, you know what? As we all learn, guys, Mr. Wayne says you're not ready to have him. You haven't taken responsibility yet. And clearly, Billy has grown as a person for the most part. For the most part. Because he still remembers the lessons of, uh, of the Magwas. Where it's like you, you, uh, you don't expose them to sunlight or they'll die. Uh, you don't get them near water or they'll start reproducing asexually. And don't feed them after midnight. That's the most important rule. Don't feed them after midnight because then they turn into gremlins. And so Billy's like, I remember those rules super well. I'm going to get you out of the office, but I still got to keep working. 
you know, at this horrible place I despise. And so he takes them back to the office, and clearly they have a no pet rule. So it's like, ooh, we're going to have some hijinks right now. And so then he puts um, uh, Gizmo in, like, one of his drawers. But then all of a sudden, the big cheese walks in chat, Mr. Clamp himself, the owner of so much property, the building. He's walking around like, I want to have a more hands-on, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, type of type of feel with my staff. You know, I want to make sure that everything's running smoothly, introduce myself to everyone, make sure things are going well. And Billy's like, oh shit, and he fucking, you know, slams the door of the, uh, with little Gizmo in, and Gizmo just breaks his fucking hand. It's horrible. It's, it's traumatic. But Gizmo hides in the drawer. Mr. Clamp is introducing himself to everybody. He eventually goes over to Billy. He's like, oh, how you doing, son? And Billy's like, oh, he's all flummoxed and everything. And then Mr. Clamp sees the drawings he's working on. He's like, oh, Mr. Clamp, as we learn, is kind of dumb. He's very uh, uh, flaky to a certain degree, chat. He's always th throwing out new ideas, but he can't really stick to one. So we, 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 we clearly understand he's not in total control of what's actually happening in his building. He just signs the dotted line, that's about it, and they do whatever the hell they want. It's like, okay. Now we see where the chaos could begin. It all started with Mr. Clamp and just his lack of control of his people and business. Bad business etiquette, chat. And ethics. And so Mr. Clamp's like, oh, Billy, you know, I, I, I like you, sir. I like what you're doing. I like these drawings you have here. This is exactly, this is exactly what my company needs. I'm going to keep an eye on you. And then fucking Red, the New Yorker, Billy's boss, you know, takes note of this. She says like, oh, Mr. Clamp likes you. And because... Mr. Clamp likes you. I'm going to try to ingratiate myself to you and in turn ingratiate myself to Mr. Clamp. You know, she's, she's just trying to move up in the world, chat. Chaos is a goddamn ladder, as we know, and she's going to climb that fucking ladder and cause as much chaos as she can because at this point she says, listen, Billy, you know what? Let's get a, let's have a work lunch. Let's, let's talk about, you know, your designs, what I can offer you. I think that'll be good. And Billy's like, well, I, I, I don't really need to do that. I'm going to be having dinner with my fiance later tonight. You know, thank you, I, I, I appreciate it, but no. But then, and all of a sudden, the goddamn uh, uh, cupboard, the little, um, uh, what was it, the um, drawer that he put Gizmo in starts opening and closing. And you hear the little noises, and he's like, oh, what's that? Is that a pet? Well, as you know, Billy, having pets is against company rules. And Billy's like, yeah, it is, isn't it? And he's like, well, uh, well, I don't know. I mean, I guess it would be kind of bad if someone found out about it. So, you know what? And Billy says, you know what? Let's let's go have that work, work lunch, work slash dinner, whatever the hell it is. She's like, you know what? That sounds great. Let's leave in like 10 minutes. And he's like, shit. And then, you know, in, in Billy's infinite wisdom, he just immediately goes to tell his wife what the situation is, like where Gizmo is, the fact that he has to go uh, on this uh, work date, basically, with his boss because she's blackmailing her. I'm sorry, Chad, that doesn't happen at all. No, he does the opposite of that. <laughs> where he does tell his fiance that Gizmo is in the building is up there in his office but he lies to his wife doesn't tell her the fact that he's being blackmailed by his boss and just says oh i just got a business meeting you know with the with some people and uh, she's like oh, okay that's i'm happy for you that that's great i mean it's just what we need to get out of our shitty apartment which is the most dangerous part of pre julian uh, giuliani new york I'm, I'm really happy for you billy maybe you can send a go for me and he's like yeah, yeah of course of course of course and then he you know he walks off and then she sees him with the red-headed New Yorker, and she's like, you son of a bitch, you asshole, what do you, you lie to me? But, you know, this, this is all internal monologue, chat. She doesn't actually say it. But she heads upstairs. Meanwhile, we cut to where, where Gizmo is doing, and Gizmo, he's just being precocious. He's always curious, as we always know, always getting into trouble. Like, he's somewhat responsible, but he's still fighting against his nature, chat, because Mogwas, to the certain, like, like gremlins, they too are very curious and precocious and they tend to get into some trouble. And Gizmo, he's the most well-behaved of them, but he still can't help himself. You know, a little bit of gremlin is still in, in Gizmo. We don't like to admit it, but it's there. And so he's walking around the office and anything. He encounters this, um, this, uh, uh, this janitor who's just muttering to himself about numbers and, and like Mr. Clamp's business. Again, doesn't really make any sense. I guess it's, you know, he's, he's a, he's a, a disgruntled employee and he goes to take a sip of water from the water fountain, just fucking splashes him in the face, like, ah, I gotta repair that. And he starts repairing, and Gizmo's right near him, and then the water just starts squirting everywhere. And it, like, oh, it misses Gizmo, he jumps to the right. You know, and then it, it squirts again, he jumps to the left. And he's like, oh, shit, I gotta get it. He runs over, and he hides under this, um, uh, I guess, I don't know, this poster board or something. 
And he's like, oh, I'm out, I'm out of the way of the water. Thank God. I'm glad I did this. And then the guy, you know, he attempts to still fix the water fountain. And then it splurts so high that it actually cascades down the waterboard and then dribbles right on a little Gizmo's head. And Gizmo's like, oh, my God. And then he just starts birthing, chat. Birthing all these little fur babies are like coming out of his back. And he's squealing. It's like, it's not a good process. It's really nice. It's basically the sound of like two cats fucking to a certain degree. Bar penises chat. You know what I'm talking about? You know, it just it, we don't like that sound coming out of Gizmo's mouth. I don't like the image I put in my head. I'm sorry that I put that into your head right now. And so he starts birthing all these little things. And they're like, again, much like the last movie, uh, these Mogwas are not as mature as Gizmo. They are, I guess, newborns technically. And they just want to run rampant. Matter of fact, they start off pretty fucking quick. <laughs> just torturing Gizmo. They're like, all right, uh, clearly we, we love life so much, but Gizmo, you're such a fucking buzzkill. We're just going to imprison you in the goddamn, <laughs> uh, 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 air conditioning grate. And so all of them like, uh, you know, get together. Oh yeah. We get different types of, uh, Mogwas. We get one that's like super dopey, you know, it's like buck teeth. We get one that's just kind of generic. We get one that's like super hyper that looks very much like Gizmo that comes in into uh, um, some importance later on in the film, actually quickly right after the scene. And then we get one which is basically Stripe 2. You know, Stripe was kind of the main evil gremlin from the original film, but he's called Mohawk in this. I'm going to call him Stripe because I kind of like this. Like, oh, Stripe lives again, Chad. He, he's come, He's resurrected himself. And we don't know. That could be Stripe. You know, again, we don't understand the physiology of, of gremlins, of Mogwai. As a matter of fact, you know, they could all be... It could just be rebirthed, you know, continuously. Like, it's a never-ending cycle or something. I think that's kind of cool that Stripe would come back in the movie. Because, for the most part, the other ones are pretty generic. And so they imprison uh, um, Gizmo in the grate, and they start causing havoc around the office. They go off in different directions. But the dopey, the, no, not the dopey one, but the one that's, like, super high energy, the one that has, like, severe ADHD, he sticks around the office. And meanwhile, Kate uh goes back up there because as billy told her you know can you grab gizmo and just take him home so we can keep him safe she's like i'll do that and so she finds the adhd uh mogwai and he, he's just acting like a little asshole he's destroyed like a good part of the office at this point he's you know just playing around with shit and he's like oh gizmo you look different and weird but she still takes some chats and then he's like you know ah! he's just spazzing out the entire time Puts it in a purse. Meanwhile, Gizmo's just looking out through the grates like oh no no i was so close i'm so disappointed and so then he wanders off. And uh, then, uh, yeah, Kate he takes him home. Uh, I think at this point, oh, and then after that, then we cut to what Billy's doing with the hot red New Yorker lady. And, you know, they're just having dinner. And, you know, the, he's basically, he's trying to tell her about his life, but she's not having it. She, she doesn't care. She's narcissistic and super selfish. Anytime he says something, like, it's like, oh, yeah, I, I come from a small town. She's like, oh, that's so adorable. She always tries to relate it back to work, check because he wants to get into Mr. Clamp's pants and his business. She wants that money, and she's going to get to it through Billy. And so she's starting to put on all her moves, chat. She's, you know, taking off her shoes She's towing his crotch and everything with her with her bare foot. It's like, oh, you shouldn't do that in a restaurant. That's not sanitary at all. And Bill, he's not here. He's like, ah, I don't like this. I have a fiance. And then he move, you know, he gets out of there. He's like, I'll see you at work later, maybe tomorrow. I don't know what the timeline kind of wraps. I guess it's dinner. I guess it's a dinner chat. And so then he leaves, and then she leaves too. Uh, and then we cut back to oh, then we cut back to the office uh, or the 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 skyscraper. And we see what the Mogwai are currently doing. Again, they're causing various levels of destruction. You know, they're in the food court and so close to midnight at this point, chat. It's like 10 minutes to midnight and they see all this wonderful food, wonderful food junk food, ice cream, a smorgasbord of, uh, of goodies for them. And then we cut back to Billy's home where uh, Kate is trying to take care of the ADHD Magua. And he's just not having it. He's destroying plates. He's eating all this. He's eating food, which is very close to midnight, but still not close to midnight, so he's kind of good. But he's just being a little asshole to Kate, throwing shit. Just th like, he literally eating, like, chicken and, like, corn, and then looking at the husk and just fucking chucking it right at her head. It's like, oh, that's rude. And Kate's like, oh, I didn't remember you being this bit of an asshole, you know, gizmo. And then eventually, Billy gets home, you know, and, oh, but, oh I forgot one uh, detail. Uh, before he left, uh, Billy's boss, Red, the New Yorker Red Lady, lays a big old smooch on his cheek and like a you know lipstick mark right there like a, like a kiss and so it's clearly like, you know it's like oh something's been happening and uh 
he gets home and he's like uh, he, he goes to the case like oh what's been happening she notices that big lipstick mark right in his face but she just says nothing she doesn't even bring it up it's like address the issues that you have they clearly don't talk to each other they're not mature enough to get married yet chat i just don't understand it and she's like well you know you were out doing your you know your your uh, uh business lunch slash dinner and i've been taking care of gizmo he's like why are you covered in shit and he goes like well you go check it out and he goes to the kitchen and fucking uh the adhd mug just chucks something at his head and fucking bonks him <laughs> and he goes over he's like well you clearly on gizmo there's something a lot wrong with you and he's just not having it and he's like okay this is not this is not gizmo clearly what happened was water got on him and uh he burved some additional magua so we gotta take care of this at this point uh and he's like okay let's leave the office let's go back well let's go leave our apartment let's go back to the office then lo and behold the fucking futtermans dick miller and his wife they they walk in because as we know chat we learned early in the film they're visiting from their economically depressed small town to stay with billy and kate for a little while because they invited them there and they're walking in and mr futterman's still a little kind of fucked up you know he's like still clearly has ptsd from his near death or in my or how i saw it clearly death experience <laughs> from the original movie and, you know they doing some you know some banter some jokey banter and and billy's like oh you know what you, you can't stay here they're gonna fumigate the building because we have a, a road infestation and dick miller's like gotcha man don't worry the wife and i despite you know we co we're coming here from an incredibly economically depressed town and we spent our entire life savings seeking the physical emotional and psychological help that we need clearly in debt no doubt about that chat we will we will sacrifice for you billy and kate and go spend money at an incredibly expensive new york hotel we'll, we'll do that for you it's, it's fine whatever you know it's okay and so they leave and Billy and Kate, they head back to the uh, the office with the little ADHD magua. Uh, now, we cut back to like what's happening uh, at the at the skyscraper office, and you know the magwas they're getting into all the food. People are kind of freaking out. It's like, oh, the rats, they're rodents. We have to exterminate them. And clearly, Chad, they've been eating after midnight. It's like, oh shit, this is not good. And so when Kate and uh, Billy get there. They see that people are kind of like, kind of freaked out. You know, they learn about like, oh, there's this road infestation in the building. And they're like, oh shit. And they're in the food court. And they're clearly, they're going to be turning to gremlins soon. This, this, this is, this is just not good. And so the, Billy's idea is like, okay, well, they're clearly going to become gremlins very, very soon. The first thing we got to do is we got to shut down all the water from the building, uh, building so they don't start reproducing, which is actually very smart. Again, Billy, he's at least mature. He understands his environment. And realizes like we gotta take out certain elements so they're less of a threat so it's like okay this is a good idea now uh they go to i guess the i don't know the the water system in the building to shut down all access so that you know the toilets aren't you know flushing sinks aren't you know splitting out water all that and he's turning this thing but on the goddamn cameras chat we see forrester the, the guy that let mr wing die could have saved his life could have gone to a hospital he didn't care he just wanted that money he's watching billy he's like that motherfucker's up to something. And he sends out one of his security guards to, to find out what Billy's doing, clearly to arrest him and fire him for... I, I mean, which it does make sense because he is tampering with uh, Clamp property, which he shouldn't be. He does not have access to that area. And the security guard comes in here. And he's like, well, what the fuck are you doing, kid? And he's like, Billy's like, oh, you know, I'm just expecting it. And clearly the security guard, like, he's dumb, but he's not that dumb. You know, he's like, listen, man, I know you think that I'm a stereotypically dumb security guard, but I'm not, Okay. All right, I know you're doing something bad. Give me that bag you have there. I don't like it. Well, what is that? Is that a weapon? Again, he's kind of smart. And so Billy's like, I don't know if you want this. And he's like, clearly I do. He takes the bag, opens it up, and the fucking ADH uh, uh, Magua fucking latches onto his face and just begins eating his nose away. And he's freaking out. He's screaming. He just starts shooting randomly. <laughs> Which, by the way, he cocked his gun as soon as he saw Billy. It's like, you probably shouldn't do that. Billy's clearly unarmed. That was unnecessary. But he's just shooting the, the, his gun off and everything freaking out eventually the little adhd magua he uh lets go and uh, he scampers off and the security guard's like what the f what was that and he's like that that was a magua and i'm gonna tell you the entire physiology of the creature he's like fuck that man you're coming with me you're under arrest even though i'm a security guard you weren't under arrest 
And so Billy is let out, and Kate kind of is like, oh, fuck that. <laughs> she watches them go. But then, Chat, we get it, we get it, we get a slow pan. As Billy, the security guard, and Kate leave the room, we get a slow pan up, and we see the gremlin eggs. They're going to be hatching, so we're going to get more gremlins. And I don't think Billy turned off the water either. It's not good. It's not good at all. Maybe he did. I don't remember. Maybe he did. Uh, I, no, no. I don't remember. I don't remember if he turned the water off or not. But, so they begin hatching. Meanwhile, we cut back to Gizmo, who is just like, well, I got to get out of here. I got to get back to Billy and Kate. I don't know where the hell I am, but I, that's, I know that if I'm with Billy, I'm okay. And so he's still crawling through the air, condu uh, you know, the air conditioner vent you know, throughout this, you know, this giant building, ends up fucking falling, and he falls into the remnants of the egg sacks that the gremlins, the mogwas, birthed themselves through. And, and you know, Gizmo was like, ah, fuck, this isn't good. And all of a sudden, this giant scaled reptilian hand just, you know, doesn't grab Gizmo. We got a little sight gag, Chad. We got to be a little funny. Just starts tapping Gizmo in the head, and Gizmo, you know, he's like, ah, and then just fucking grabs his face. And then... Anytime we cut back to Gizmo throughout the rest of the movie, which we do, uh, on about three or five times, uh, the gremlins, particularly Stripe 2.0, he's just torturing him. He's just, like, uh, beating Gizmo, uh, using light, uh, shoving in his face, using electricity to zap him, tying him to train tracks, and having the train hit him over and over and over again, just torturing Gizmo. Not only, like, physically, but psychologically. Breaking Gizmo's mind. And that leads to something later on in the film. But it's really fucked up. I was like, this is terrible. This isn't funny at all. This is not the darkness that I want in this film. And then it's all done under, like, comedic circumstances. Like, nah, I don't, I don't like this. Don't, don't hurt Gizmo. No, thank you. And so, uh, oh. And then I guess we cut later uh, to the police station. And Kate immediately gets Billy out of the police station and he's like, how'd you get me out of there? And she's, you know, fixes her dress. He's like, I gave them next month's rent. <laughs> and he's like, ooh, ooh, that's, I don't like that. And so they, they leave the police station, go back to the office building. They go to Forrester, who clearly was the one who initiated the, you know, the, the arrest of Billy. But Forrester's like, ah, oh, Billy, I see that you're back right now. What are you doing here? He's like, listen, man, you got infestation of gremlins. And Forrester's like, what the hell are gremlins? All the staff are laughing at Billy. They don't believe him at all. You know, they think he's full of shit. And they start questioning about the physiology. Billy's happy to explain the physiology of Mogwai and Gremlins, but they're not having it. And then all of a sudden, this fucking Gremlin bursts out of the goddamn uh, uh, computer screen, bites one of the other workers. And, you know, they're screaming. They don't know what the hell's going on. Billy, mature Billy, grabs one of the lights that are there, it shines in the Gremlin's face, and that scares him off. He's like, oh, sh I was like, okay. Now everyone starts believing that the Grumlins are real. Clearly that thing is not a rodent. That's not a giant rat. That's a reptilian monster creature from China. So they're spreading the Cornoro virus, Chad. It's a nightmare. <laughs> uh, and so, okay, Mr. Force is like, okay, Billy, you know what? I, I'm an asshole. I'm going to be asshole throughout the rest of this movie, but I'm going to have one good moment here. Let's go talk to Mr. Clamp about the situation. Then we cut to Mr. Clamp who we saw early on in the film chat, you know, interacting with his workers and everything. And he's up there in his office, and he doesn't know what the fuck to do with himself. He just lives in this building his entire life. He's like a Howard Hughes, except dumb, and has better hygiene. But that's basically what he is, you know. And so he's looking at his telescope, and, you know, he's spinning around in his little desk chair and everything. And then he calls the secretary. He's like, hey, secretary lady, let's send out some memos to some people. And she's like, all right, whatever. And she's just eating her sandwich here. She just wants to eat lunch in fucking peace. And she's got this idiot constantly calling her on the answering machine, the telephone. And she's like, all right, I'll top up your memos. Meanwhile, we see a gremlin fucking messing with her food chat, puts a mouse trap on it, you know, between two slices of bread. Because clearly, when she would reach over with not looking at her sandwich whatsoever, because you never look at the food when you're eating it, chat. Reaches over for the sandwich, picks it up, doesn't under, you know, doesn't understand that the thickness of it has changed, or that it's now super heavy because there's a mouse trap on it, or she could feel the wood, proceeds then to put it in her mouth. We, we cut, chat. We cut from that, chat. We don't see that. And we hear that <laughs> snap. And we hear the, ah, we hear her scream. And she comes like, Susan? I think her name is Susan. Susan, are you okay? I, I kind of like this because Mr. Clem genuinely cares about his secretary, Chad. I thought he wouldn't like, what did you do? What did you fuck up? No, he's kind of like, again, he's not a bad guy. He's just dumb. He's just kind of dumb. And I think he means well, but he's just so naive and rich that he doesn't even know what he's doing most of the time. So I don't think he's a, like a genuinely bad guy. He's not like Forrester. He's just an asshole. And so he goes out there 
and Susan's not there, but someone's sitting in his desk. And then we find a gremlin dressed up as Susan. It ripped off her skin and is wearing a chat and her clothes. And he's just typing on shit. And he's like, what are you doing with Susan? What do you do my secretary? And her fucking corpse, skinless corpse is in a corner somewhere. And at least that's how I would have had it. And then the gremlin attacks him, fucking bites his hand. He starts wrestling with it. And this really shitty looking puppet. And then he puts it down the paper shredder that she was shredding all his mail in. And they're like, you know, it's kind of a cool scene, actually. And there's like goo and guts and blood, like hitting his face. He's going, ah, just all in his mouth chat. I actually like this scene a lot. And um, he kills it. And then fucking Billy and Mr. Forrester, they walk in. It's like, oh my God, what the hell happened? He's like, what do you mean? What the hell happened? The devil got attacked by this monster. And then Biz, uh, Billy, always excited to explain Mogwai and Gremlin's physiology, tells Mr. Clamp about the Mogwai and Gremlin's physiology. Mr. Clamp's like, okay, we got to take care of this. We can't involve the police. We can't involve outside help. You know, we have to take care of this ourselves. And actually, Billy kind of agrees in this matter. He says, yes, because we can't let them outside the building at nighttime. Because if they get outside, they'll have access to water. It's New York fucking city. They'll take over New York and eventually the planet, Chad. The gremlins are going to be a worldwide threat. We are setting the stakes at this goddamn moment. And so Mr. Clamp's like, shit, I, we, no, yeah, we can't let him get out. And Billy's like, he starts to play to Mr. Clamp's ego. It's like, we stop him here, man. You'll be a goddamn hero. You'll save New York because he wants to get access to the resources to stop the gremlins by ingratiating himself with Mr. Clamp. So, you know, Playing his ego, not fucking him like, uh, you know, uh, Red, the New York lady. Just, you know, doing that kind of thing. And Glam's like, yes, I, I like you, Bill. Let's do that. Mr. Forrester reluctantly agrees, even though he fucking hates Billy and definitely wants to kill him. And he's like, okay, you guys do that. I'm going to wait here and take a shower and clean up my little boo-boo. And so they go ahead and do that. And again, the Gremlins chat, they fucking taken over. They're fucking with all the different channels now. You know, they're making ridiculous appearances. They're on a cooking show and it's lame. <laughs> they're they're on um i can't remember some some of the stuff is just lame uh yeah they, yeah the one's in like a pot he's like you know shitting and covered in noodles uh one explodes a microwave and everything and it's like okay i get it it's a lot of shenanigans shit. a lot of shenanigans they're tearing people apart not, not really tearing people apart just you know kind of fucking with them uh eventually we uh we run into oh yeah that's it that's what that's what starts all this kate is giving a tour guide of the building despite the gremlins tearing it apart and uh she's with a very stereotypical asian man that's the one thing i said chat like a lot of stereotypical asians in this film <laughs> where you got mr wing who basically looks like fucking confucius and then you get i assume this japanese uh tourist and he's obsessed with taking pictures this wants to fill everything and take all the pictures chat and he loves taking pictures of the gremlins that's when they walk in the cooking show and then the old lady's getting attacked and mauled by all the gremlins and stuff and she gets the fuck out of there and but the mr wing he just wants to he just wants to take in all the chaos chat he's like i'm gonna put the, we this is history unfolding in front of our faces at this moment we, this needs to be recorded and so he's taking pictures of the gremlins and kate's like we gotta get the fuck out of here uh japanese tourist man and so they leave Eventually, Billy and Mr. Forrester do run into Christopher Lee, who's kind of in a fucking panic. He's like, this might be my fault, <laughs> to a certain degree. Even though I guess it kind of isn't. I mean, his assistants, his pedophile assistants, did bring bring the gremlin into the, the building, but he didn't know about it. He just wanted some germs. He just wanted to catch the flu, chat. That's all he wanted. Uh, and so he's like, okay, all right, we, we, can, we can stop the gremlins. I got a plan. You know, I have di different chemicals we can use on them. It'll be great. So Christopher Lee, Mr. Forrester, and Billy, they go back to his lab. But then the gremlins also follow them. And they start fucking with everything in the laboratory. Start injecting themselves with different stuff. Splicing themselves, chat. And Christopher Lee's like, this is my worst goddamn nightmare. Some things in life didn't need to be spliced. And here we are. One becomes a bat-like creature. One gets hyper-intelligence and starts talking. Again, that's a big joke in throughout the movie. Uh, he kind of speaks for his fellow gremlins. He's kind of, in a way, chat... Um, the MLK of the gremlin community? I don't know. <laughs> he's, he's, he's a spokesperson from the gremlin community. He's like, listen, let's, let's take it easy. We just want to be recognized as, as, a, a, as, a, as your equal. Except all these other people are just murdering each other. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a little goddamn bizarre. He's, yes, uh, perfect golden. He's the Lorax of, he's the woke gremlin. <laughs> Oh my god. Oh, he is he is the woke gremlin. Golden. Absolutely right. <laughs> Dank, welcome to the stream. How you doing? 
Oh my god. He's pretty much the woke gremlin chap. And so he's just he's just laying down the truth. You know, saying, like, listen, we just want equal rights. We want to be recognized by you. Meanwhile, while he's saying all this, their fucking Christopher Lee's being murdered. He gets his fucking hand bitten off. And then a gremlin, which then becomes the element of electricity, <laughs> suddenly just courses through his body and fries Christopher Lee from the inside out. And Christopher Lee's dead. It's like, all right, that's the gremlin uh, murder I like. So Billy, so he's panicking. Uh, one of the, the super intelligent gremlin finds... This is weird. Genetic sunblock? Where you can inject in yourself and you're totally immune to the sun? And its effects is like, okay, clearly you should use that on all the gremlins. But he just chooses to use on one. It's the one with the big old bat wings. And then the bat gremlin, it escapes from the building and it makes the bat symbol because Warner Brothers also owns Batman Chat, much like they own the, the gremlins license. And so it goes out there and it starts terrorizes New York. Meanwhile, Billy... Uh, he gets the fuck out of there. Forrester's getting physically raped <laughs> or at least molested by a female gremlin. And he's just humping his goddamn leg at this point. It's like, it's not, it's not great. It's like, it's inappropriate. It's like, no, thank you. And so Mr. Forrester, he leads the picture for the most part. This is it. We don't see him until like the very end. But Billy, he's just trying to get out of there. Eventually, uh, we get back to Kate who lost uh, the Japanese uh, cameraman. And she's on her own. She's in an elevator chat. The gremlins start attacking the elevator. They sh they're trying to get in and just torture her. She manages to manipulate it to the point where she basically crushes all of them when it finally does land. And we get another sight gag of like the elevators open up and the two people are out there. It's like, we'll get the next one. It's like, ah, very funny. And so when we go for on from there, you're reviewing good movies now? No, how man, it's a bad movie. What are you talking about? <laughs> Rock a birdie. Trump doesn't represent New York. We hate him. Goddamn right we do. Mm hmm Ghost Hound. This movie's a critique on Trump and the New York he represents. I mean, that's kind of, yeah, exactly. That's why I said Mr. Clamp is very much the Trump of this movie. Except he's a little, he's definitely more charming than Trump. And unlike Trump, Mr. Clamp is just, he's, he's dumb and he's naive. But I don't think he means ill towards people. He just doesn't know any better. He's surrounded himself with wealth for so many years. That he just doesn't know what he's doing. You know, whereas Trump is just a fucking asshole and a racist and a misogynist. Like, Mr. Clamp is not those things. Like, he actually cared about his secretary, Susan. I think that was her name. I don't remember. But he clearly cared about her. It's like, okay, this is, I, I understand. Like, you're trying to ingratiate yourselves to Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, Clamp, but also to say, like, hey, this guy, he's not all there. So, Kate, you know, uh, she gets out of the elevator shaft. Eventually, uh, Billy and Kate go back to Mr. Clamp. Oh, no, 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 they don't go back yet. My mistake, chat. No, that doesn't happen yet. Uh, Billy goes back to Mr. Clamp and he tells him of the progress and basically says there's a lack of progress and Mr. Clamp says, all right, well, fuck it. It's over. And he then gets his uh, VCR out and his VHS tape, which is basically the, well, civilization's over. God bless America and all that. And he starts crying. It's like, Billy's like, ah, shit, what are we going to do here? I got to help this guy. So he starts to like, no, we got to pump, you know, no, no, you can be the savior of the city, Mr. Clamp. Mr. Clamp, you know, again... <laughs> the attention of a fucking goldfish goes, yeah, I could be the savior of, of, of New York City. And so they use Mr. Clamp's secret Batman elevator tunnel that then takes them outside the building. And Billy's out there. Oh, I forgot, chat. Meanwhile, all this happened, we also follow the Bat Gremlin, which is a terrorized New York. And Mr. Futterman, Dick Miller, is then uh, attacked by uh the flying gremlin he starts fucking with it. again the ptsd just kicks in chat and he has to murder this thing they're and there's just they're wrestling again and eventually there's like a cement truck nearby and he just drowns the motherfucker he just makes sure that he's gonna die but he doesn't drown him effectively because the gremlin does finally get out of it and he starts fl flying off you know and he, he lands on this church and he just turns to stone because that's how cement works chat it it dries very fast so then we cut now we're at the the part where Mr. Clamp and Billy, they're outside the building. Mr. Futterman comes in. He's like, he's with Billy. He's like, listen, I know what's going on here. It's these goddamn gremlins. We got, we got to stop him. Uh, uh, Mr. Clamp's trying to get control of the situation, everything. Billy goes back in the building via the secret tunnel. Mr. Futterman eventually goes back in the building via the secret tunnel as well. And Billy and Mr. Futterman, they team up. Meanwhile, uh, Fred the Vampire Dracula, he's like, this is my goddamn chance, man. I'm, I'm, I'm at ground zero. I can tell people what's actually happening in this building. So he starts broadcasting to the world the, 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 the creatures, the gremlins, and what they've been doing inside uh, uh, Clamp Towers right now. And he also eventually interviews the super intelligent one, the woke gremlin chat, 
And uh, it's, it's actually, you know what? This part was kind of funny because the woke gremlin then eventually ends up just fucking shooting his other gremlin. Again, camping's nature chat. And, you know, Fred Jack was like, fuck this, I'm out. <laughs> and so we uh, eventually cut to the sexy uh, red New Yorker lady uh, with the super red hair. And she's like, where the fuck is everybody? And so apparently she didn't know that the building's under attack uh by these demonic little creatures and eventually chap she gets stuck in a spider web this giant fake looking spider web because we learned earlier that uh stripe 2.0 he's also spliced himself with this like spider dna he drank a, a ton of it and he became half gremlin a half spider hybrid creature and so he's just laying traps so where he can eventually get to people suck out their you know their innards by vomiting inside of them or laying his eggs inside and then having to burst out of the chat. It's very, it's like, Jesus, this is fucked up. So this could happen to uh, the sexy red-haired New Yorker lady. But we then cut to Kate and she finds her and there she's trying to cut her out. Meanwhile, Stripe 2.0 is coming right towards them and they're having a heart to heart. It's like, I know what you tried to do with Billy and Red. It's like, I'm sorry I did that to your, to your husband slash fiance. It won't happen again. He's actually a really good guy. We never, we never did anything. Pretty shitty that he lied to you though. He should have been actually honest with you about the situation. But again, you're kind of immature. Um, but then Kate kind of fucks up trying to cut it down. The, um, the spider gremlin starts crawling near him and all of a sudden chat we see gizmo and he's <laughs> he is now not the gizmo that we've seen in, in 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 the previous version uh in the previous film or early on the movie he has gone fucking nuts chat the torture the emotional psychological and physical violence that is part that he has partaken on his little furry body has warped his mind and all he remembers chat is john goddamn rambo from those six weeks earlier that one piece of television that he saw and that has consumed his life and he has trained himself to be john rambo fucking bandana got the the, the black stuff on under his eyes and everything fashions himself a little bow and arrow out of a paper clip he's like i'm gonna fucking kill all these gremlins in here and that's the first thing he does chat he sees his torturer the person who tortured him for like the better half of a day and he takes this little makeshift fire arrow fucking fires it at him and like and it just explodes on strike 2.0 covered in this liquid i guess glue or something or whiteout and this apparently whiteout is extremely flammable because it covers his entire body he just starts burning it that thing and gizmo again he doesn't cut the gizmo and then going to Kate and the red-haired lady to free him. Gizmo just watches. He just stares, like not blinking, just stares, and he fucking smiles. That's it. It's like, Jesus, this is not the gizmo I know. This, this is uncomfortable, chat. I don't like where we are in this movie at this point. And so eventually, Billy and Mr. Futterman, they come to save uh, Kate and the red-haired lady. They get around, they get gizmo, and he, gizmo's just fucking wall out. He just stare, he's just staring at nothing. He just doesn't care. He finally killed his torture. He doesn't know what to do with himself now. Like, he's completed his life's purpose. So they get out of there. They eventually meet up with Fred Dracula. And they come up with a plan. They realize, okay, okay, listen. Let's trick all the gremlins to uh, get to the lobby where then we can use the sunlight from outside to then burn them. And so uh, Mr. Clamp, he's doing the whole thing where he has, like, these giant sheets where it's like stars and moon and it's black and so trick the the goblin or the goblins the gremlins visually and they also work from the outside messing with the electronics turning the clocks to like uh, like 8 p.m. and it's like oh clearly the sun will be set by then in New York City and then we can take them out so all the gremlins get to the lobby and everything but they can't open the doors because the whole building is shut down they can't get open and so it's like Billy's like fuck what the hell we got to do and then he's like Billy comes up with a plane he's like all right it's fucking risky. This could blow up on her faces, but let's use some water. Everyone's like, why are you using water? That's one of the rules. He's like, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta stay with me. Because, chat, we learned earlier on in the film, Mr. Clamp and Billy, while they were in his office, they were also attacked by that electricity gremlin that uh, killed Christopher Lee. And they managed to trap him inside Mr. Clamp's phone. I don't know. I don't know how that works. I don't know how science works, chat. But they, they trapped the electricity gremlin inside the phone. Billy has the phone. And they start spraying all the gremlins down, covering the water. They start birthing all the babies, chat. This is gross and weird. And then Billy's like, all right, fucking let them loose. And they let loose 
the electricity goblin, he shoots right at all the gremlins and he starts frying them, Chad, because electricity and water, they do not mix. I don't, may not know science, but I know those two things do not mix, Chad. And it just starts frying them. They, that's the screaming, melting. The super intelligent Roman gives like a goddamn soliloquy, but you don't even it's, you don't even hear it really well, Chad, because he's just gurgling out his own innards and skin and flesh and eyes just falling on his goddamn face. This is kind of cool scene. I do like this. Uh, and so they're all dead. And then they finally get the doors open from outside. They go ahead and walk in. Mister Clam, you know he's championing himself. I'm the hero, but despite saying that, despite you know. Saying, look, we, we got control of the situation. It's fine. These these creatures are all dead. He gives some shout-outs to some people. You know, he sees Red, the secretary, who he has a connection with. Like, clearly, these two are meant to be. He fucking promotes her to his head of public relations. So she's like, oh, thank you so much, Mr. Clam. She starts talking to the TV people. He sees uh, Billy. And he says, you know what, man? Uh, thank you for helping me. And he also then... Uh, you, you also start talking about how, oh, you know what? You inspire me. You make me want to write another book. I need, I need like a, pe a pencil and a piece of paper. And Billy's like, oh, here, here you go, Mr. Clamp. Mr. Clamp, he's like, oh, thank you, Billy. And he unfolds and he sees Billy's hometown. He's like, Billy, this is genius. This is what we need. This is what I've always wanted to do. We need, people don't want the, the modern accessories of 1990. They don't want all this technology to be inundated with corporatism and consumerism. They just want to live their lives. They just want to have families. That's it. We're going to give that to him, man. We're going to sell it to him. <laughs> and he says, we're going to start Clamp Corners. Uh, suburbia for the, the best of America. And Billy's like, hell yeah, man. Let's fucking do it. And, you know, they start shaking. Billy's clearly going to be a millionaire. Kate is like, yeah, okay, but let's make sure we get a lot of money. Clamp's like, don't worry, honey. I'm going to give you a lot of money. Don't worry about that. He's like, who are you? I don't even know who the hell you are. He's like, oh, I'm, you know, Kate. Thanks. Uh, I'm Billy's fiance, soon to be wife. He's like, oh, that's great. I'm going to be at the wedding. And then Fred, the broadcaster, I think he's also promoted to like reporter for the clamp network, I guess. And, uh, yeah. Oh, Mr. Funimer, uh, again, still fucked up as hell. Uh, you know, he's PTSD. His wife comes in they start hugging. And it's like, oh, they're back, but I beat them. I killed them. They tried to kill me, but I killed all of them. So he's actually very excited. He beat his fear chat with murder. Gizmo, by the way, just fucking stare him. Just walled-eyed and looking at all the destruction. All Basically, all of his children who have all melted. He's just smiling, chat. Gizmo is broken. This is not the Gizmo that we know from the earlier film. Or even the earlier half of this film. He is not the same Magua that we have seen. He's damaged. And that's it. That's all we see of Gizmo. I guess Gizmo and Billy are happy, but you know Gizmo's fucked up for life. But, chat, we, we left one little uh, plot thread loose. And we cut back upstairs to, I guess, the splicing laboratory where uh, Christopher Lee burned to death. Much in the same way the Gremlins did. Although not as, um, you know, graphically. And uh, we see Mr. Forrester. He's just, you know, he's had a rough time. Fucking clothes ripped apart. Fucking smooches all over his face. And we see the, the, the female Gremlin. One's alive. But that female gremlin, she doesn't want to cause destruction. She just wants to love. And her true love is Mr. Forrester. And she has forced him to marry her. And so we're going to get into some bestiality nonsense. Looks like in a quick second chat. That's what Mr. Forrester deserved because he was a prick. He was terrible to Billy. He caused the death of Mr. Wing. He could have saved his goddamn life, but he didn't. And he gets his just desserts. Who is that? Cameron Dot. 542, thank you for the follow. Welcome to the stream. How you doing today, my man? Hope you're having a very nice Tuesday evening. And guys, that's credits, man. That's Gremlins too. And let's I'll tell you right now. It's not, it's not like horrible. It's not a bad movie, but it's not nearly as good as the first one in any capacity. I do think that the teeth have been ripped out of this film. Um it, it gets into some weird dark moments, sure, but not in the same way that the original did. It, it, it this feels like it's repeating the same stuff, but it doesn't go the extra mile of certain things. And I think that's what just makes it kind of a shallow experience to me. You know, I mean, yeah, there's some fun visual gags seeing, you know, psychotic gizmo and things and some appearance from the actors I've, I, I always really like. But overall, I don't particularly care for the film all that much. You know, I mean, what about you guys? What, what did you think? Of Gremlins too. Maybe I'm maybe I'm alone in this. Gizmo is the yo yo. Yes, young Rambo. He is. Let's get that Rambo Gizmo spinoff, guys. Let's see a short film about that. Hmm. 
Death Rage, do I think that Gremlins remake is going to be bad? I heard that they were doing the animated series on Netflix. I didn't know it was going to be a remake. Am I wrong? Because if that's true, that sucks. I don't want that. That's the last thing I want. No, thank you. Hmm. Yeah. Young Remember, this movie sounds fucked up. It kind of is, man. It's weird. It's very much a product of its time. And it was canceled. Oh, I, I don't know. I didn't, I didn't know that they were doing a movie. I just know that they're doing that, I think, Netflix animated series. Oh, maybe that's on HBO Max. It's a Warner Brothers property. That could be it. Because there's that, and they've been trying to get a Gremlins 3 off the ground for years. The basic idea is pretty fucked up. I mean, I, mean, I, I just don't think you need a sequel. You know, Gremlins will always be, always be a part of the pop culture zeitgeist, but it doesn't have the same uh, uh, level of popularity it did in the 80s. I don't think it ever will again. It'll always be remembered for that original classic film. Like, when this film came out, guys, funny enough, it actually got okay reviews. I think it, you know, critics actually liked it more than audiences did. It was the audiences that actually didn't like this film because they didn't respond in the same way they did the first movie. Despite critics actually liking the, the cartoony tone, the film... Uh, bombed actually it was five times as expensive as the first whereas the original one or nearly five times the original one had like about 11 million dollar budget this one had a 50 million dollar budget and it grossed 41.5 million dollars this was a huge bomb for warner brothers back in the day uh and that's why the series never continued it's like oh shit i guess it's not nearly as popular as we thought it was and i don't know six years after the original that's what even during the time that they were doing sequels long after the first film had come out, whether it had been Terminator or Alien or something like that. But yeah, the the the, um, the the fervor for Gremlins just was not there as it was for certain other properties. And it was just, again, it was just an inferior sequel. And this could have been also the time where people just like tired of bad sequels, you know? So yeah, it just, it kind of ex it exists to me. It wasn't as bad as I remembered, but it's, I don't, I don't think this is a good movie. I think it's fine. It's fine at best. Nowhere near as good as the first one. So, you know, I, if I had to give it uh, a rating on the Double Toasted scale, I'd probably give it a rental. It's a rental, whereas Gremlins is a full price to me. I, I really love that movie. This, this, is a, this is a rental. You know, check it out if you want, but is it necessary? You know, only if you want to watch it at home. Like, I wouldn't have recommended seeing this in the theater because you don't need to. Yeah. Oh, the Hulk Hogan joke. Jeez, I forgot about that. No, it was not Austin. Don't say that. See, that's the stuff I just forget because it's like, why is this here? Because they like, very much like in the beginning of the movie when they cut to Daffy Duck and Bugs Bunny. He's like, I, I get it. You own, <laughs> you own these characters. But it has no relevance to what's actually happening in the film. It's not like when you, because you think about Who Framed Roger Rabbit. You know, opens up with that cartoon segment. It's like, it actually has a purpose. You know, it's like, oh, this leads into the movie. It shows what, what Roger Rabbit's career is and, you know, how tunes are viewed in this world it's like oh this is kind of really super creative and stuff where this one it's just it's just bugs bunny and daddy duck making a cameo it serves no purpose. it has nothing to do with the movie itself they just introduced the film it's like all right thank you guys here's gremlins 2 and they leave it's like what what is that make any sense same with the hulk hogan cameo where the movie just at one point the movie stops chat i totally forgot about this the movie stops the gremlins destroy the projector and you know the the the, the uh the fuck what, what the, the the guy i the ticket guy i guess i uh, the 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 uh, what's the what's the guy at the uh thank you sarah but the video so long story short gremlins one so long story short gremlins one good gremlins too bad exactly sarah ah the um actually i don't i can't remember the guy the guy who takes the tickets to the movie theater um he's like oh no the gremlins are destroying the theater but i know who to call and he goes to another movie screen or another uh, screen and he, there's hulk hogan he's like hulk hogan can you help us and hulk hogan just starts talking and he says gremlins you know you're gonna mess with the hulkster and they start the movie again and it's like okay it was super lame it was not funny at all i did not like it yeah chat yeah it just exists it's it's a solid rental in my opinion